Hello, Nick Smith here, speaking to you from London. Welcome to number 27 in our series of Alpine Clubcasts. It is just seven months since Rick Allen, one of Britain's greatest yet most modest Himalayan climbers, died attempting a new route on K2. Tonight, the Alpine Club would like to pay tribute to his life. To help do this, we're joined by Simon Richardson, Jerry Gore, Sandy Allen and Nick Kikas. A special welcome tonight to members of the Scottish Mountaineering Club and also University of Birmingham Mountaineering Club, both clubs with, with uh, which Rick had a strong connection with. Anyone on Zoom, if you'd like to share any of your memories of Rick, there will be an opportunity to do so later on in the evening. Um, and anyone on YouTube or Zoom, uh, feel free to write something in the chat area. The Alpine Club is an extremely active club for alpinists and we're always looking for potential new members. We welcome both experienced alpinists and those gathering their experience who may be suited to aspirant membership. If you'd like more information on joining, please get in touch with me. Uh, I help to run the, the Meets program or have a look at our website. One of the most wonderful things about Rick Allen was that whilst being a world-class mountaineer, he still took time to attend meets and climb with ordinary Alpine Club members quite early in their careers. And back in 2020, he and I worked together on Alpine Clubcast number six, which is about his ascent of the Mazzino Ridge with Sandy. And that Clubcast now has nearly 11,000 views on YouTube. Michael will share a link to it at the end. I thoroughly recommend it. Rick is sorely missed. I'm now going to hand over to Simon Richardson. Simon is best known as a Scottish winter climber, of course, but he's a keen alpinist too. He first visited the Alps over 40 years ago and has since climbed many classic routes and grand course. Simon enjoys looking around new corners and has made 18 first ascents on the Mont Blanc range alone. Further afield, he's climbed new alpine routes in Alaska, Canada, the Cordillera Blanca, Indian Himalayas, Greenland, Karakoram, the Caucasus, and even South Georgia. Over to you, Simon. Thank you, Nick, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this evening's webcast. I'm going to start by reviewing Rick's mountaineering record. Now, Rick's record was phenomenal, of course, but Rick was a very modest man. He didn't publish many articles. So what we've got here is has been compiled from journal references, um, from his annual Christmas letter, which uh, he sent to his friends. And uh, Roy Lindsay, who is with me this evening, has also provided significant help. So Rick's, um, Rick was born in London um, in November, 1954. Um, his father introduced him to the Scottish Hills with a sense of Shehalian and Ben Nevis. But his climbing only really took off when he joined the University of Birmingham Mountaineering Club, where he quickly became a very good rock climber and developed a strong interest in winter climbing. In 1975, he climbed Castle on Tower Ridge with Robin Walker on the Ben, and a year later he did 0.5 Gully with Jim Fotheringham and Chris Duck. He went to the Alps with Robin in 1975, and uh, he uh, went to Mount Kenya with Roy Lindsay in 1980, where they climbed the West Ridge and Diamond Kulwar of that mountain. And in 1983, he climbed the north face of the Duat in winter. In many ways, this was a fairly typical set of climbs for a young, ambitious 1980s climber. And there was no real clue of the, climb of, the, of the climber that Rick was yet to become, except perhaps for the Velsenbach group on the north face of the Gletscherhorn, he climbed in 1978 with Chris Duck a remote, serious and rarely climbed route. Um, and that's a photo of it on the left of the picture there. So Rick's Himalayan climbs reveal more about Rick's pedigree. In 1980, he visited Nepal by himself and with a Sherpa in support, um, climbed um, Tarpachuli or Tent Peak um, via a new route on the west face, did that solo. Um, in 1982, he visited the Gangotri on an on a expedition led by Roy Lindsay. 
where he made the first ascent of Curtis Stamp, um, a 6271 meter peak. Rick was climbing with his long standing partner, Ernie McGlashan, but the pair backed off due to dangerous snow conditions. But after the slope avalanche, Rick went back up and continued alone to the summit. During that trip, um, he met Nick Kikas, and two years later, they visited Nepal and climbed a new route on the two and a half thousand meter high south face of Ganesh 2, 7111 meters. They reached the summit on the ninth day in a storm and spent three days descending back to base camp. So they're out for 12 days, a magnificent achievement. It was largely ignored by the mainstream climbing press at the time, but it made a big impression on the upcoming generation of British alpinists. A benchmark had been set. If your new route was not climbed in pure alpine style and did not take at least 12 days, then you really weren't trying hard enough. And then two years later, he visited Nepal again with Sandy, um, where they climbed a new, new route on the south face of Pumori, a beautiful line. It has been repeated, I believe. I think what's notable about all these four ascents was they were all climbed in perfect alpine style. So Rick's ability to acclimatize and perform strongly at altitude really was extraordinary. This became apparent on Mal Duss' expedition to the northeast ridge of Everest in 1985. Climbing solo, Rick reached the expedition's high point at 8170 meters. The remainder of the 1980s was taken up with another trip to the northeast ridge of Everest and also Makalu. Neither trips were successful due to difficult snow conditions, but once again, Rick reached over 8,000 meters on both mountains, confirming his strength at altitude. None of these expeditions were successful, but as consolation, Rick climbed the Eigenal face with Sandy in 1989. Rick had a strong affinity with the um, mountains in Central Asia. Um, in 1991, he made the first ascent, first British ascent of Khan Tegri um, in the Pamirs. And in 1992, he visited uh, Tajikistan with Doug Scott and uh, a Russian climber, Sergei Efimov, where they made the first ascent of the difficult east ridge of Chimpark, sorry, Chimtitago, I think it's called, 5482 meters. Rick actually moved to Tajikistan in 2006 um, for work, and he climbed there extensively, especially in the Fansky Mountains. Details of his ascents are incomplete. Um, as I said, Rick did not leave a comprehensive chronology of his ascents. But we know in 2006, he made the first British ascent of Peak Karl Marx, the highest in the range, and the first ascent of the North Ridge of, North Ridge of Peak um, Oval Raya, both with Phil Wickens. And in 2008, he returned to the Pamirs and made the first British ascent of Peak Kortunesca, another 7,000 meter peak. The meeting with Sergei in Tajikistan was very significant. Uh, because Sergei invited Rick to join a Russian expedition to Dalagiri in 1993. This seven-man team um, was successful in forging a difficult new route up the North Face. This was Rick's first 8,000 meter peak and an astonishing achievement on a grueling and very technical route. Rick learned to speak Russian before the trip and he calmly adapted to the Russian diet um, their main sustenance on the seventh day ascent was cabbage soup. So more 8,000 meter peaks followed. In 2000, Rick climbed Everest with a commercial expedition. Um, this success was well deserved after his previous strong performances on the Northeast Ridge. But Rick realized that large organized expeditions were not really where his heart lay. Um, in 2009, he climbed the Daimir face of Nanga Parbat with Sandy, um, a, 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 a significant personal ascent. And in 2011, he climbed Hidden Peak, um, his third um, 8,000 meter peak. Um, he was so modest about this achievement, it, we only found out about it because he made a, a reference to it in one of his Christmas letters. So the Mazino Ridge on Nanga Parbat, um, Rick had attempted this with Sandy, Allen and Doug Scott in 1995. And in 2012, 
um, Rick and Sandy decided to return to the Mazzino Ridge and have another go. Um, by this time, Rick and Sandy had accumulated a significant amount of high altitude experience. And the 10 kilometer route had been attempted many times since the 1970s as one of, and was one of mountaineering's last great problems. To gain the main summit, you have to traverse the eight Mazzino peaks, which are all over 7,000 meters to reach the Mazzino gap. Different to previous expeditions, they devised an alternative strategy where a team of six, so it was Rick, Sandy, the South African climber, Cathy O'Dowd, and um, Latka Rangdu, Latka Nuru, and Latka Zarup from Nepal, um, they all planned to, they all traversed the ridge together, uh, which would provide more firepower for the summit push. It took nine days to reach the Mazzino Gap. And after a failed summit attempt altogether, only Rick and Sandy have the physical and mental energy to try again. So Rick and Sandy set off with mineral supplies for their summit bid. Deep snow meant it took two days rather than one to reach the top. And then they had, then they had an epic three day descent and extreme avalanche conditions. Um, and of course they were exhausted and dehydrated. And the story of that, it's one of mountaineering's great survival stories. Next slide, Nick. Should be. All right, okay. So after the Mizzino, I mean, Rick's and Sandy's 18 day Travis was widely acclaimed as one of the finest climbs, Himalayan climbs this century. It was certainly the most important British success in the high Himalayas since Stephen Venable's ascent of Mount Everest Kanchen face in 1988. Rick and Sandy were awarded the PLA door, but Rick was a humble man. Um, rather than putting the trophy on display, he used, to prop up, use, he used it to prop up his creaking bookcase in his Chamonix flat. Despite this success, Rick remained focused on big mountains and was determined to continue climbing them in good style. In 2017, he attempted a futuristic new route on the northwest face of Annapurna with Felix Berg, Louis Russo and Adam Bilecki. They were unsuccessful, but they climbed to Licho, 7134 meters as a consolation. Later that year, Rick climbed the two highest peaks in the Ruinzori Mountains of Uganda with Mike Lean, both prized and rarely climbed summits. Then in 2018, Rick climbed Broad Peak. This was his fifth 8,000er. Although I guess success was overshadowed a little by um, uh, a rescue aided by a drone. And then in 2021, uh, he uh, was on his final expedition to K2 that Jerry will talk about uh, in more detail in a moment. I climbed a lot with Rick over the years. Um, often it was very impromptu. Rick would often arrive in Aberdeen and suggest we go climbing. Um, it was either sea cliffs, the climbing wall, or winter climbing. Rick was always happy in the mountains though, he was just perfectly at home. In 2009, um, the picture on the left shows Rick on a route called Farewell to Tajikistan. Um, it was climbed um, in a very snowy January on Craig and Fiddler, which is above Loch Callister in the eastern Cairngorms. Uh, we skied in, Rick on ancient wooden skis, and we snatched the route in very poor weather, arrived back at the car well after dark. All in all, it was a typical Rick outing. Rick's Scottish winter climbing often took place in some of the most serious of locations. Um, he climbed new routes on Avagin, which is Scotland's remotest Munro, Larvan and Ben Lair. His finest contribution though, was the first winter ascent of Raven's Edge on Bucoletic Moor with Brian Sprunt in 1984. Uh, this spectacular route is now recognized as one of the finest mixed climbs in Glencoe. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Nick Kikas. Um, Nick is one of the strongest alpinists of this generation. Nick has climbed new routes in South America, the Himalaya and the Karakoram, and has taken part in over 25 expeditions, including ascents of Everest and other 8,000 meter peaks. So Nick will talk about Ganesh too, which is one of Rick's most 
formative roots. So over to you, Nick. Thanks very much, Simon. Yes, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, recognize my uh, climb of Ganesh uh, 2 uh, in 1984, the South Face. I first met Rick in 1982 in the India on the approach to the Gangotri. Uh, I was trying to climb this spectacular northeast face of uh, shivling while Rick was uh, with a a small and assuming group of Scottish climbers exploring the upper Gangotri Glacier. And he made uh, the first ascent of Curtis Stamp solo in a, an inner storm. It was uh, certainly uh, a sign of things to come for Rick. Over the next few years, uh, Rick and I climbed together in the Alps and in Scotland, and we hatched a plan to climb an alpine style ascent of a, of a major peak in, in the Himalayas. We were looking at a suitable 7,000 meter peak. Uh, Rick was working for uh, an oil company in Aberdeen at the time and had limited uh, leave. So it was uh, an objective we needed was something that was easy, easy to get to uh, a, a reasonably short walk in. And uh, Rick had been doing a lot of uh, research uh, over the years and he, come up with a couple of objectives in the, in the Ganesh Himal, uh, northwest of Kathmandu. And, and certainly in the 80s, uh, on a clear day, you could see the, the Ganesh Himal, but I suspect in polluted Kathmandu these days, you probably won't be able to see these mountains. Ganesh 2 is on the, on the right of the picture here, the south face straight, straight on to the uh, camera, uh, and Pabil Ganesh 4 on the, uh, on the left. On the uh, walk in, Rick, uh, the typical of, of Rick, he insisted that uh, we uh, carried heavy rucksacks. Uh, he said it would be good training, endear us with the porters and our Sherpa support crew, and most importantly, it would save us money. It was a classic sort of approach in, uh, in, into a Nepalese um, peak, uh, not a really good trail, lots of lots of uh, river crossings, pretty precarious, uh, and uh, a lot of bushwhacking through, um, you know, dense forests. Uh, in night, I think there's quite a good trekking trail into, into the south face of, of Ganesh Himal now, but in that day, uh, it was a pretty, pretty awful uh, trip uh, through, you know, machetes to hand at times to get through some of the, some of the forest. Anyway, we came out of the forest to this absolutely fantastic location. The, the base camp sat on this high alp right uh, below uh, uh, the south face of, of Ganesh too. It was uh, probably one of the most spectacular base camps I've ever been to. Um, th there was a large Swiss team had been in, in a, about a, a week before us and they were going to try and climb the, uh, the, the left-hand skyline uh, between Pabil and uh, Ganesh to um, and they were doing it in siege, siege uh, style, fixing ropes and, fi uh, and establishing camps. Our, our route uh, was, was to the right-hand side of the, of the summit. There's a sort of rock spur coming down. Um, and we were trying to get, pick a line in towards the center of, the, of all these complex sort of uh, snow flutings and rock walls. The route had been, uh, attempted previously in 1983 by uh, a very strong um, team of um, Poles led by Janusz Meyer. Uh, and they'd climbed that rock spur on the, on the right of the, of the camera there, and then cut out onto the right-hand skyline, the uh, south, southeast ridge, uh, and then got in, uh, snarled up in these rock pinnacles uh, and just ground to a halt, couldn't make any progress and retreated, uh, tragically one of their the, the team was was killed on the descent. So with, um, with that kind of knowledge, we, we, we were quite kind of uh, uh, unsure whether we, could, we had the capability or the capacity to climb something like that. The Poles in that in that area had a great, as they do even to this day, a, a great rep reputation on, on such climbs. We, we did a little recce up the lower part of the climb, stashed some food and then decided to to set off 
with essentially seven days food, uh, not really knowing what we were going to encounter. Uh, certainly uh, some rockfall threatening the lower part of the route from these steep walls above. Um, and the, the climbing was uh, weaving up sort of poorly protected slabs, some of them covered with snow, uh, others with uh, steep, steep rock walls. Uh, we actually encountered in one, one of these little rock walls, we actually found a bit of old, old fixed rope that the Poles had used the, the year previously, which uh, certainly aided our progress on, on, on this pitch. But the key, key to the upper part of the route was this, uh, there was a, an easy snow ramp about sort of just below half height. And that was the sort of key passage to get us into the, to the upper section of the, of the climb. And uh, from there, we knew we had to, to, to cross a, a big amphitheater of, of uh, snow flutings and steep ice to, to get across into the center of the face. And it was, uh, it was very concerning coming across this, this section of the of the route and we actually stopped short um, uh, on the day before we crossed this slope so that we could get a re really early start get across to the other side before uh, rocks started coming down this this uh, uh, restriction we managed to get across pretty pretty quickly uh, and then uh, ahead was a sort of a very steep rock wall which uh, Probably on this poor slide, it's hard to see, but it was really poorly bonded uh, ice that was on a on steep rock. It was all rotten. Something you had to just gingerly uh, pick your way up. And Rick led a fan, you know, absolute fantastic uh, pitch here. Really poorly protected. I think he put about about one runner in the whole pitch. Uh, certainly, the ice was uh, not a sort of consistency that would take a take a decent ice screw. Interestingly, on this climb, we, we actually, uh, we, we took a, a two or three ice, uh, ice pickets, which I'd only previously used in South America, but they, they certainly came, uh, became useful uh, on, um, on this climb because the snow was, being a south face, was really affected by the sun at times. But, but as we climbed up, the weather was really, really deteriorating. We were getting these snowstorms coming in in the afternoon and the frequency of them got worse and worse as we got, got higher up. And we got to a point where uh, there was, we, we just couldn't um, find a, a, a decent um, tent site. And it was you know, a, a case of sitting on a, a little icy ledge, ledge with our little uh, single skin Gore-Tex tent over, over our heads. Uh, sat on, on on pretty pathetic carry mats to uh, to provide insulation from the ground, and we were just got in a real real bad way. But by, by this stage, we were about seven days out. Uh, food food was running running short, uh, and the weather was uh, pretty evil. Um, and we were just really weren't sure whether we could continue. But the, the prospect of of retreat from this position was was pretty pretty poor, and we still had. Although we didn't have a lot of food left, we we um, we had plenty of gas, so we felt we could we could push on uh, and and get to the get to the get to the summit, which we did finally uh, on the ninth day. Uh, essentially, as I said, we ran out of food. It was blowing a hoolie, uh, and and the situation was pr pretty grim. We'd always anticipated that the, the way off the mountain would be to, to go down the, the southwest ridge, uh, the route that the, uh, the, the Swiss expedition were trying. And um, we fantasized at this point uh, of Swiss chocolates in their high camp uh, and uh, clipping into their fixed ropes as we got further down and, and away down to safety. But the weather was just awful on the summit, and we literally moved about 50 meters from the summit down the down the southwest ridge, and it was just becoming impossible. And we just dug in and managed to dig a snow hole uh, on the uh, just literally 50 meters from from the summit. So we're down sort of the red line there, showing pretty much our route. Uh, the the left hand skyline was the the, the descent route uh, southwest ridge. We'd gone down about 50 meters or so, dug it in. We had a pretty good night there, actually, out of the wind. But then the next day, it was a real, a real fight down this ridge. And we got to a point where we just encountered a couple of really uh, awful 
precipitous rock pinnacles, which there was just no way we could get past them easily. Uh, and, and the weather was just appalling, really, really strong winds. So we, we, we literally decided to bail down, uh, down back onto the south face. And uh, just on the extreme top left-hand side of the picture there, you can see a very steep rock uh, wall um, with, a, with a snow shelf leading sort of left to right downwards. And we, we, we decided to go abseiling down there, really steep ground, leave, leaving lots of our... We, we sacrifice all our ice screws on the upper slopes. Um, or we lost mu much of our rock rack as we uh, to repel down this uh, rock wall, uh, which was uh, incredibly steep, till we reached this snow shelving uh, and then managed to pick our way down. It was another two days from there, another two bivvies on the face before we picked a slightly parallel line to the, to, to the left of the right line, uh, um, which was um, uh, obviously potentially uh, swept by, by, by snow avalanches at times and, um, and rocks coming off uh, uh, these rock, little rock bands. But by that stage, we were kind of committed to just forcing our way down the mountain uh, as best we could. So on the, it was 12 days uh, as we uh, finally reached uh, the, the, foot, the foot of the face. And anybody who knew Rick will know he was a skinny guy at best, didn't have a lot of spare meat on him. But certainly the, the pair of us were absolutely emaciated after, after that climb. Uh, on the walkout, we both uh, got Jardia. We were really ill. Um, it was uh, a, a really sort of miserable walkout. Um, I think Rick didn't insist on carrying heavy rucksacks on the way out, as I recall. Um, but it was certainly a, certainly a route march back because Rick was on a, 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 a tight schedule. He had a flight to catch back to Scotland to, to start work. And literally five, six days out of, out of base camp, we were back in Kathmandu and Rick was, was organising his flight back. Um, it was, you know, for me, it was probably one of the, the most important incredible climbs I've ever done. It all just seemed to click like clockwork. Uh, and Rick was such a, a calm and reliable um, companion. And I think for Rick, it was the start of a journey uh, onto the, the highest mountains of the world, really. And, and he never looked back. I'd like to now hand over to our next speaker. Sandy Allen is an IFMG guide. He's one of Britain's most respected climbers, as much for his Scottish winter exploits as his impressive greater ranges climbs. I believe he was Rick's most influential climbing partner and together they made a formidable team. Over to you, Sandy. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for logging into this Alpine Club cast. It's really good that you could all make it. Hey, thanks, Nick, for that introduction. Uh, oh, my good friend, Rick Allen. Uh, to be frank, it's all a bit early for me to be talking about Rick because he just died about seven months ago and his accent is still very fresh in my mind. But I'll do my best and persevere. Uh, I first encountered Rick in Chamonix, France in the early 80s. In those days, there was no mobile phones and we used the post resort messaging system to contact each other. Fortunately for British climbers. The, the Brasserie Nationale in the Rue Dr. Pacar, Chamonix was the main hangout for, for all of us. There we could meet up, drink beer and exchange information. The pr proprietor was Maurice Simon and on the wall along from the L-shaped bar was a notice board where we could pin up short messages to other climbers where Rick and I tried to organise our meets. We never actually got the chance to climb together in Chamonix in those days as we were either climbing with other people or working on our offshore oil schedules. I finally got to know Rick better at Brian Sprunt's funeral in Aberdeen. A Brian had fallen to his death from a bad bivouac in the north face of the Matterhorn during a winter ascent. Rick and I became good friends. We got to know each other very well and we started climbing and ski mountaineering together. Rick and I were both a, Rick and I were both employed in the oil business based out of Aberdeen. Rick had earned himself a position with Texaco 
which years later merged with Chevron. I worked for an oil service company where we used caving and climbing techniques to access and carry out work in remote and awkward, hard to reach places on oil and gas platforms and drilling rigs. We used ropes instead of scaffolding. Rope access was innovative, brand new and an exciting business to be involved in. Rick was Texaco's client representative in some of our contracts that I was involved with in the Texaco installations. But Rick, Rick was not just a climber and mountaineer, but also a very important figure in the oil and gas world of Aberdeen. We both had to entertain clients and at times our paths crossed at Her Majesty's Theatre in Aberdeen as we accompanied our potential clients to ballets and other shows. A, Rick got married to Alison Greger, a, and just by chance, I knew Alison as she lodged in a house share run by my good Scottish climbing partner, Andy Nisbet, who, as well as my regular new rock, new route Scottish climbing partner, was also a biochemist at Aberdeen University at the time. My sister Eunice also knew, was studying microbiology at Aberdeen and, and was a good friend of Alison's, as was, and my twin brother, just by total coincidence, went to university with Alison's brother, Malcolm. So we've known the family for a very long time. Anyway, Rick and Alison got married and were incredibly happy for a, for a number of years. But after a few years, Alison unfortunately got cancer and died. It was really hard on us all, but especially for Rick and the Gregor family. I'd, I'd say Alison was the Rick of love, love of Rick's life. And while Rick did get married again many years later, Alison always had a large part of his heart. Rick and Alison were very social and spent lots of time highland dancing, attending operas and ballets, and, and they were very involved in the church. And that took up a lot of their time but still he always managed to get fit in lots of climbing. Also by this time, Rick was, quick, Rick was quickly rising through the ranks, establishing his oil business career and became much respected in that business. It was actually incredible that he could wrangle time off from his high power job to get long periods away from work to enable him to climb in the far distant mountain ranges with me and with other people. A, of course, we pulled every trick in the book to add value for Texaco, even calling the steep grade five pitches on our new route on the south face of Pumori, the Tartan Couloir, after Texaco's Tartan platform. We named the climb the Scottish route too, as it was around that time that I decided that Rick was climbing well enough to become an honorary Scotsman. But of course, he was London born and bred, and he loved Scotland. Rick and I did tons together, and much of that is well documented. So I will not recant these old climbing tales. Thanks a lot to Simon and Nick for, for telling us what they have done already. And uh, as, you, as, you, as we all know, Rick did uh, some very impressive climbs. Anyway, we climbed our new routes in Pomori, which at that time was considered very technical for a high altitude climb. Back then, only a handful of climbers, such as the Polish, the Russians, Mick Fowler, Victor Saunders, Alex McIntyre, Andy Parkin, Doug Scott, Jeff Lowe, Alison Hargreaves were really attempting such technical, technical climbs in high mountains. It was a really exciting time to be in the Himalaya as climbers were moving away from fixed rope style expeditions into alpine style climbing. Unfortunately, Pete Borman and Joe Tasker got lost in Everest on a Chris Bonington expedition climbing alpine style, and that was a really big shock to everyone, every one of us. We were lucky. In a way, we were lucky as Mal Duff, and I suppose myself as deputy leader of the Pilkington Everest expedition, invited us all to try the then unclimbed East Northeast Ridge of Everest after Pete and Joe went missing. That was our recognized first attempt at an 8,000 meter peak. And of course we were all sailing close to the wind. But we handled it pretty well. Rick did, as Simon said, Rick did really, really well and soloed the, the, for the last couple of days up to his high point. Rick and I went back to the still unclimbed ridge several years later, but this time in pure alpine style. And I invited Doug Scott as we thought his street cred would help in 
influence the MEF and assist with other funding. Over the years, we both had built up a relationship with Doug and he became a very close friend. So that was two trips to Everest and one to Pomori. Rick and I were having a ball of a time and building our friendship and high altitude confidence. Doug Scott was well impressed with us, so he invited us along to his, onto his attempts of the Mazina Ridge of Nanga Parbat. And after several attempts, I eventually came up with what I thought was an award, was a, a winning formula to climb it. That was the coolest trip ever, and we were awarded some accolades for it. The best one being that it was described by those self-promoted armchair type types who record and seem to have become authorities on such things that our ascent was the climb of the century. And that was particularly interesting to Rick and I as we were, just be, we, we were only a few years into the 21st century, so it all seemed pretty ridiculous. You can read about that in, our, uh, in my book, In Some Lost Place, and of course there's an Alpine club cast about that, which Rick did. Rick and I then had still desires to try other unclimbed ridges, and which were on our radar. One was on Kanjanjunga, which many of you might know about. Kanjanjunga is the third highest 8,000 meter peak and Broad Peak. It was turning out impossible for us to get permission to climb on Kanjanjunga. So Broad Peak was left. And while acclimatizing there on the normal route, Rick's desires were overtaking, overtaken by summit fever which resulted in me organizing a rescue, which Simon referred to. But thanks to the help of Andre Bergel, who, Bargel, who was planning and, and impressively skied K2, and Andrew's team had spotted Rick's inert body with their drone, which undoubtedly helped to prolong Rick's life. He, he was then... It was then that I realized also that Rick had a desire to take all the 8,000 meter summits so we kind of differed a lot with that aim, as Rick was, previous to that, a very, very cool and keen technical climber, and he had never expressed an interest in that. But it was something that we, very, we differed a lot with for, in that aim. For, for me, it was the last thing in the world that interested me to climb with fixed ropes and routes that were climbed so often by, by lines that were pioneered such a long time ago. But still, we were becoming older, and I could totally understand why Rick was interested in, interested in doing such a thing just to pass away his retirement. However, mountaineering is about having fun, and while it wasn't something I wanted to do, if that sort of thing floats your boat, then I don't see why you shouldn't want to do it. So, so I was totally supportive. Rick went away with Jerry Gore to try Broad Peak, and of course, I was invited along and I, and, and I thought about it a lot, but I could not really build up any en enthusiasm to join the project. So I sent him away with much gusto and good cheer, warning him to be careful of ego and to be very careful of avalanches. As soon as I heard that some of the team were struggling with initial acclimatization and sickness on Broad Peak, I did wonder what Rick would do and uh, because I knew he was, he'd be really strong as ever, he, as, as he always was at altitude and would not want to rest on, it, on his laurels. To my surprise, he teamed up with some other climbers who were trying a new route on K, K2. Unbelievably to me, he was trying to, they were trying to climb a line. Rick had actually tried about 30 years previously and we had discussed it a lot. And on that occasion, the team were really lucky to escape some serious avalanches and that they actually said they would never go back to that climb. So I have no idea why Rick was there. Unfortunately, this time Rick was leading up one of the early ice fields and a huge avalanche came down and I've been reliably informed that he died almost instantly. I'm sad to say that my wonderful friend, that was the end of my life of my wonderful friend and climbing buddy Rick. I wish to take this opportunity to thank Jerry and their local agents and staff for recovering Rick's body and taking it down to be interned at K2 base camp. It's a fitting burial place for such a wonderful man. But of course, while we all tell ourselves that it's cool to die doing what one loves, I still think being alive is pretty good to value twos. So I miss my dear friend Rick terribly. 
Rick was humble. Rick was humble, honest, sincere, and a very, very reliable climbing partner to me. He was a bold and tenacious climber, and sometimes I thought he was too bold and stuck his neck out just a bit too far. As you know, we climbed the Mazzino Ridge with the help of Cathy O'Dowd and, three, and, uh, and the three Lakpas, and eventually Rick and I summited and got safely back to base camp. We were both very bold, probably stuck our necks out far too far and pushed the boundaries of what was thought to be possible at extreme altitude. So please note that I do not say Rick was over pushy lightly. Some may say it's the pot caught it, calling the kettle black. Rick was a devout Christian, and while, I'm a, and while I am a Christian too, too, Rick had a sort of scary belief that he would always be okay. And of course, as it turns out, of course, he is okay. His body lies at K2 Base Camp, and as the Sherpas have told us for years, that the body is but an overcoat for the spirit. So that's where Rick will be, in the palm of God's hand. Rick was a superb mountaineer, nearing companion. A reliable teammate and a top class fellow. And I will miss him forever. They say the best climbers are the ones having the most fun. And I, and I can assure you that with Rick, I had a total blast. It's now my pleasure to pass you on to Jerry Gore, who is well known by you all, I'm sure. Jerry's down in the Ekron Massif, and he was with Rock, Rick at K2 Base Camp. Over to you, Rick. Oh, sorry, over to you, Jerry. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sandy. Okay, so um, I don't have much time. I'm just going to go through the last few years uh, leading up to Rick's death on K2. Uh, it's a long story with the ton of things that happened, but I'll be brief as we, as we simply don't have that time. Okay, so I actually first met... Um, uh, Rick, in 1985, we tried the scoop on Stone Allardale, uh, got a pitch up, and then rain stopped play. Uh, but together with his first wife, Alison, and my wife, Jackie, we had a great time wild camping on remote island beaches and enjoying driftwood uh, barbecues. Um, I met again um, Rick just by accident at a Dave Pegler a Velo Fest. That's like a, a cycling festival, uh, funnily enough, in my own uh, in my own chalet. Um, and uh, Rick and I immediately recognized each other. We immediately hit it off and we re restarted our, our friendship of all things, road cycling on the amazing, um, lovely tarmac of, um, of the uh, Ekran uh, uh, mountains. Uh, th things, uh, things moved on and, and we get to autumn 2019 after um, cycling. Uh, day uh, we had uh, dinner here in uh, in Valoise, and he told me about uh, the Broad Peak drone adventure story and his love affair with a new potential route on Broad Peak that he'd been planning with with Sandy and a great Canadian climber called Louis Rousseau, who's hopefully with us uh, tonight. Um, and that really became our mission to attempt Rick's uh, new project, a new route project on Broad Creek. And here it is in all its glory. I can't give anything away, of course, um, but uh, it still remains very much unclimbed. But that was our passion. And that's what, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time trying to organize. Um, uh, during uh, the intervening uh, two years, 2018 and, uh, sorry, 2019 and 20, uh, Rick and I did a lot of Alpine stuff. Um, reacquainted ourselves with Alpine Rock. Um, this is the north ridge of Elfwad Central, very close to where I live. This is the Arete de Costa Rouge, um, leading up to an amazing summit, 3927 meters. Uh, we, <laughs> we had a total epic on this. Um, we managed to go off off route. We, um, I, I had to lead all, all the rock. It got a little bit sketchy. Um, and I, I, I remember one little couloir, we're in a quite a narrow couloir, and I was above Rick, and, um, and then this big rock, probably head size, came shooting out. We both saw it. It bounced off the, um, so the right-hand side of the couloir and then literally passed between me and Rick. 
and we both looked up, looked down, and then went, oh, and, and I saw Rick, uh, I saw his face and he was going, hmm, you can see he was just kind of processing the information, but I, I definitely saw amazing uh, mental strength. Um, he was also uh, great on open bivvies, as I think you, you've already gathered. Here he is, just another, yet another um, open bivvy on, on uh, going up to El Fouad uh, Central. And he's just tucking in for the night, nice big um, smile, getting out a tiny little sleeping bag, and all at the age of, I guess he's like 66 then, something like that. I just think it's amazing, and he just totally inspired me. Um, and so, um, you know, we, uh, we, <laughs> we, we started our, our descent of this, of this mountain thinking, well, yeah, we're pretty tired. And uh, I was sort of slowly walking down gingerly thinking, oh, yeah, I mustn't go too far. Better wait for, for Rick. And then <laughs> at one stage I turned around and he was right behind me tiptoeing down because of course he could go way faster, but uh, he, he didn't want to overtake me. Such a gentleman. Um, and so we get to, uh, to K2, uh, January 2021. Um, I come up with this great idea that we, uh, we climb K2, um, a mountain I've always wanted to, uh, to, to climb. Um, and then once acclimatized, we do a recce on the new route that Rick had been planning on Broad Peak. We plotted and planned. We had tons of problems with... Um, Sherpas not coming because of the outbreak of uh, outbreak of C19 in Nepal. Then there's no oxygen cylinders because all the bottles from Pakistan get filled up in Nepal. Then more COVID problems. We went right down to the wire, and literally the week before the 14th of June, we got the go ahead that the commercial expedition that we wanted to take a part of um, was on, and we could uh, off we went. So uh, suddenly uh, we pitch up in Islamabad. Um, we meet lots and lots of people. Um, this was Rick's 10th trip to Pakistan. My, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my um, I, I think it was, it was my fourth trip to, uh, to Pakistan. Um, and he was just totally um, au fait with everything Pakistani. The fact that most of the team were less than half his age. And he just uh, he just went into Rick Allen expedition Pakistan mode. It was it was brilliant to watch. Um, we did a bunch of things in Islamabad. Of course, one of the major things is actually transferring money uh, from dollars to uh, Pakistani rupees, and that again was a great opportunity to see one of his superpowers, which is the ability to go to sleep pretty much anywhere, even in a bank. Um, and he just he just goes straight to sleep. I love it. Um, anyway, then uh, then we get uh, we get to uh, to Skardu. We start um, planning what's actually going to happen. Now, our our aim was to to join this commercial expedition, um, but to be totally independent. So we carried our own kit, our food, our tents. Um, we'd use the fixed lines, put in on the mountain, but we wouldn't get embroiled in all the um, shenanigans. And trust me, there were a lot. You can see Broad Peak. Uh, behind you or behind us on this picture and this is um this is rick on like day four of the walking in full short, um, pakistani mode he's got his shawal on he's just uh, he's just one of the one of the uh, the locals and uh and just fitted so well in uh, in that whole environment um, then we we start uh, um, forging our way up a broad peak to acclimatize um, we put in our own tents, cooking our own food, wondering, I was wondering why our sacks were so bloody heavy compared to our commercial client friends who were like carrying nothing. Uh, Rick uh, was so strong. I mean, I hadn't climbed with this guy before at altitude. I climbed with, with quite a few, um, you know, uh, mountain legends, but um, he was carrying rucksacks, at least the weight of the local Pakistani guides he was 68, they were 25, 26, and he was always the first up the fixed ropes. And I was just in awe. I just thought, how does he do that? And during this time, um, throughout this like six, seven week expedition, we got talking about all sorts of things. I had a, a really, I had a really good connection with, with, with Rick. We could just got on so well on, 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 on so many levels. Um, and 
like I think everybody has said tonight, he's in, uh, Rick's an incredibly modest guy. But a few things came out because I kept pushing him. Um, we talked a lot about Doug Scott. We talked a lot about Doug Scott's strength at high altitude. And he actually said, yeah, you know, Jerry, and he really said this under his breath, despite it was just him and me in a tent, there's no one else there. He said, yeah, I think probably when I was at my height, I was probably sort of as strong as Doug when he was at his height. I said, did you really say that, Rick? And he goes, well, no, probably not. But anyway, he said it. And personally, for me, I think he was uh, just an incredible guy. Another thing he said that sort of physiologically explained why he was so strong, he did a paddy diving course in Australia when he was based down there. And, he, and I remember him telling me about the diving instructor who had seen hundreds of um, you know, diving uh, uh, divers and, and how they operate underwater. And the diving instructor kept saying when they got to the, to the surface, hmm, uh, that's not normal. No, people don't behave like that. And I think my conclusion at the end of this period of acclimatization on Broad Peak was that, you know, um, Rick is just one big bag of oxygen and uh, there's not much else on him, but there's a lot of oxygen in there, that's for sure. Um, so we did our acclimatization um, and then this, this weird thing happened that I think Sandy's alluded to literally three days before we plan to go up the normal route, having acclimatized on Broad Peak, it's all set. And suddenly this guy, Jordi Tozas, on the right here, a Spanish IFMGA guide, um, and a, just a brilliant high altitude mountaineer. They call him the pirate. Uh, you just have to Google him. This guy's done outrageous stuff. Um, he goes, right, well, uh, we're going through, you know, I'm up for this new route. I, I want to do the East Face Direct. Uh, who's with me? And immediately Rick put his hand up. Immediately another uh, IFMGA guy called Stefan, he put his hand up and I didn't. Uh, I was invited. I could have gone with them. I hadn't, but I wasn't, I wasn't prepared psychologically. I wasn't prepared physically. And I wasn't going to change my game plan three days before a climb. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, but I wished them well. Rick had always wanted, in that, those three days leading up to it, and of course, all the, change, all the plans had to change. I had to team up with a Pakistani guide and, you know, sort out tents and food and stuff. He, he kept saying, oh, Jerry, you know, let's, let's go for a hike. Let's go for a hike. And I was busy, to be honest. I said, well, Rick, you know, we've just been up to the memorial, um, or, the more, um, or the series of um, memorial plaques on K2. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, you know, I don't have the time, but he wanted to say something. And I always, I think for the rest of my life, I'll probably wonder what he wanted to say, but probably knowing Rick, he just wanted to say, look, I'm sorry, but I want to go. And I totally understand that. All of my life has been about new routes in the mountains, whether it's big wall or high altitude or alpine. And um, here was an opportunity to attempt a new route on the east face of K2. And there's no way I was going to tell him to stop. Um, the fixed lines were there. And so I took them. So this shot was taken on the 24th of uh, July. Um, and this is the last shot I took of Rick. Uh, he'd just come up from uh, base camp. We're at advanced base camp on the Abruzzi Ridge, the southeast ridge of K2. We're at about 5,600, 5,700 meters, something like that. And then these guys came through. Um, they put up the tent. We, we had a chat. They said they were going to go off really early in the morning. Um, and me and... Um, the uh, the Pakistani guy that I was with, Momo, uh, we we said, well, we're we're going to go up the fixed lines on the Abruzzi, but we'll go a little bit later. Um, and literally, um, this is the the last shot that uh, Jody uh, took of of Rick. Um, they're now well above um, advanced base camp, probably in the mid sixes, something like that. Quite steep ground. Uh, Jody took this shot. And then what I found out later from Jordi was that there was actually four avalanches. The first one came down. There's a big rock in it. It took rock out, um, Rick out and he was dead. The second one cut the ropes and he went down, uh, probably fell maybe four or 500 meters. Um, uh, at about 10 o'clock the day he died on the 25th, 
I got the radio call from Meza Ali, the leader of the commercial expedition, that the expedition was off, Rick was dead, and everybody's going down. Um, in retrospect, I sort of queried that decision a bit, but really it seemed the most natural thing. This legend, this man who all the guides knew so well and respected him so much, uh, they couldn't carry on. Um, and he was dead. And uh, I came down the ropes. I then spent some time with seven or eight Pakistani guides looking for Rick's body. We found him at about one o'clock in the morning or, you know, the, the, the day or the very early in the morning after he died. Uh, we took him back to advanced base. And then uh, the next day, um, oh, sorry, let me let me just explain where he died. So you can see this um, uh, ridge, this uh, vague uh, gray rock um, ridge, uh, just to the right of the center of the pitch. There it is. And just if you can stop the cursor there, just up a little bit, just there, that's around about the sort of area where we think the avalanche occurred. We're not sure, um, but it was around there. And then he went right to the bottom. Um, we found him, uh, like I said, uh, one o'clock um, the next morning, very early. Uh, we, we then put him, uh, we'd, we wrapped him up in a, a fly sheet. I went down to advanced base camp. We sort of didn't really sleep that night. And then all the Pakistani guides, plus myself, um, went down just below advanced base to create a tomb and to create a burial site for Rick. You can look right down the glacier there from K2 down towards K2 base camp. That's Rick's view. That's his resting place. That's what he's seeing. Uh, that's what that's that's where he's he, he he's lying. And it was pretty emotional, but at the same time, you know that you were taking a man down from the mountains to to effectively stay in the mountains in one of the most beautiful mountain places on the planet. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is the shot of the team uh, once we created uh, Rick's um, uh, burial site and we buried him. I said some prayers. Um, um, Ashad, the guy at the top in the orange jacket, he said some, some uh, Muslim prayers. Um, there's Jordi on the left. He was helicoptered off the face where, after Rick um, went and taken down to base camp. And he pretty much ran back up from base camp up to advanced base to take part in this little ceremony. Um, and we paid our respects. We made sure that he was OK. We put him to bed and I said goodbye. Um, so I just want to leave really a little uh, leave by by saying this. Um, during this expedition, um, I gave um, Rick a little book. Now, some of you might know this book. It's Nan Shepard's book, The Living Mountain. Rick absolutely loved it and thanked me for this real gift, as he put it. And here's a quote from that book, The Living Mountain. The presence of another person on the mountain does not detract from but enhances the silence. If the other person is the right sort of hill companion. The perfect hill companion is the one whose identity is for the time being merged in that of the mountains as you feel your own to be. I just wanna say that Rick was for me, as he was for so many others, my perfect hill companion. That's it from me, and back to Nick in London. Thank you, Jerry. <clears throat> and uh, superb. Thank you so much to, to Simon, Nick, and Sandy, of course. So, folks, uh, now is a moment for us all to share any personal tributes that you'd like to, uh, either by putting a, a hand up or by writing in the chat uh, in Zoom or on YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm going to kick off, actually, while we're waiting for those to come in um, with, a, with a question for any of the speakers, actually, who'd like to. Um, mountaineering is all about the partnerships we forge and, um, and the memories we, we share with our partners. So what was it about climbing with, with Rick that, that really set him apart? 
I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, Nick. Um, Jerry's really touched on it with what he just said. Um, I, I think Rick was always happy in the mountains. He was always perfectly at home. Um, and it, that's because he understood the environment. I mean, he'd, 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 he understood mountains. That was backed by huge experience. And because of that, he just exuded confidence, quiet confidence. Um, you know, as Jerry says, he really was the perfect partner. Thanks, Simon. Um, um, Mike, if you could unmute uh, Phil Jarding, that would be great, because uh, I think Phil wants to say a few words about, about Rick as a student. Uh, can you find him, Michael? Well done, you found him. Go ahead, Phil. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, Rick was a student at Birmingham University. Um, he started in 73 and finished in 70, uh, finished in um, 76, I think. He did chem -en, chemical engineering. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen. Am I allowed to share my screen? Yeah, go ahead, yes. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a picture of Rick um, at uh, a joint meet with the Italian Alpine Club that Adele organised a couple of years ago. Um, but um, the people at Birmingham, who Birmingham with him, can you see that picture? Yeah. Um, the people at, who were at Birmingham with him rem remember that ascent. There's, um, if you know the Birmingham campus, there's a huge um, clock tower right in the middle of it. And um, Rick did a, um, I think that's the East Face, I think, or may, maybe I'll be corrected, but the main thing that the university was concerned about was damaging the clock, or the clock face, I think, but um, um, but he kept a lot of links with the University of Birmingham Club. They're called the Stoats, actually, and he had a lot of Stoats around his flat um, in Chamonix a few years ago, I remember, and they were terribly impressed to meet this um, Himalayan legend, really. And the... Um, the Stokes are organising a Rick Allen Memorial Lecture every autumn. The first one was given last year and there'll be one next year as well, actually. So that'll be a nice way to um, uh, keep his memory going. And I would very much echo what everyone else said about Rick being a, a really good partner to have when you went climbing, actually. That's all from me. Thanks, Phil. If you could stop that share, that, yeah. would, be, that would be great. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, Francoise, are you there? Francoise, I, I gather you want to say something. Yes. Hello. Hello. I uh, know Rick uh, much later than most of you. Um, I asked him to share the stage with me when we presented the award of the spirit of mountaineering to the four uh, Pakistani pilots. It was 2018, I think. Um, and we had, we had a big do at UNESCO with like 700 uh, in, the, in the audience. So that, that's how I got to know him first, because he had been involved in the rescue. I mean, he had been rescued by these guys also. Um, right. And then, then I got to him and I've discovered that he had a flat in Chamonix and I have also a place in Chamonix. And so he generously invited me to go and climb with him sometimes. And I have the most delightful story about us ice climbing. So we, we arrived in Cogne, like most of you know, know this place. And when we arrived there, most of the lines were taken, mostly by a very large group of the French army. And the only one that was left for us was a, a really hard one, really difficult one, not, not one that I would choose to do. But anyway, that was all. So we, we start up, you know, walking up there to get ready. And then and you could see the commiseration on the face of these um, um, French army guys, looking at us thinking, who is this old couple there? You know, there was Rick with his uh, really vintage um, um, equipment. He had an old um, helmet, really big old jacket, Gore-Tex from the 80s, I don't know. And I was behind, you know, a little bit overweight, huffing and puffing, you know, not looking really like the part, you know. So, so we kind of, you know, he starts climbing, and when he starts climbing, they all shut up. Everybody looks at him climbing. It was unbelievable. It was a place with overhangs, with, you know, 
really difficult technically. And it, it was crazy to hear the silence suddenly as they watched him climb. So that's my best memory of a week. And of course, the mother. Thank you, Francoise. Wonderful. Uh, Rolo, uh, I see Rolo, you've put your hand up. Uh, uh, Michael, can we unmute Rolo? I wonder if I can do that. I know I can't. Yes, there you go. Yeah, hi. Rolo. Hello. Hi. hi. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, my name is Louis Rousseau. I'm from Canada, from Quebec. I shared my rope with Rick uh, for, during four expeditions. I want to thank uh, everyone, Jerry, Sandy, and uh, also the other people that I didn't know. Um, for me, it's also very difficult for me because I, I, I climbed with uh, Rick also on K2 in 2019. And we almost summit and he, I fell down after the bottleneck and he saved my life. And uh, I never shared this story really. So uh, we were very, very high. I think I have the record of a leading fall on K2. It was really, really high close to the summit. And I, I took a, a whipper on the a wind slide, a wind, slide a wind slab. Uh, just before we tried the, this famous project, the, the southwest ridge of uh, Broad Peak, which he tried uh, two, 22 20. years ago, 24 years ago with Andrew Locke. So we, we didn't mention that, but he, he tried this, this on climb ridge. I want um, to finish to share a video. I hope it will make, make you uh, smile because we had a lot of fun with Rick in the tent. Um, he was a man of few words, but when you um, you you go uh, on expedition and uh, in 2019, I don't I don't know what happened. And he kind of opened up about uh, his life, his and his, his uh, and his spirituality as well. And uh, he was a different a different guy with me, and uh, we we laughed a lot. And it, it is I want to share this video. I will try to. Uh, to share my screen, and I hope uh, it will put a, a smile on everyone. On yeah, it's really short, but I hope it will work. Um, make sure you share it with video sharing. Okay. Is it working? No. It worked. No. Uh, do you want to try again? When you pre when you click uh, share, just make sure you sh you click uh, optimize for video. Oh, okay. I'll try. Yeah. Or maybe I will just uh... wait. No. I don't think it will work. You can do share screen, share again, and then yeah. um, do optimize for video as you do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I sh I share my screen or I share video. Either should be fine. Okay. That's easy. Okay, okay, let's try it again. What was the last one? Is Tamin for allergy? Uh, Diphen. Diphen. Oh. And we also have some per some some uh, periton. Um, periton. Periton. We have. Fantastic mixture of all sorts of things here. Aspirin. Should I put that in there? This is broadly divided between medicine and addressing personal 
physical injury, but it's kind of all mixed up now. Extra strong paracetamol, 500 no. mil codeine. Again? Again. Oh, no. That goes in there. So we're okay if we're seriously injured, but if we <laughs> you got a headache, you're stuck. <laughs> But you had the Motrin also? Yes, right? I have the Motrin. Okay, Motrin. good. So the Motrin will do the trick, I think. Yeah. What's this? Oh, that's the... Yeah. Well, there we go. And these are all new stuff, eh? No. It's all, it's all from previous expeditions. Previous, like... Uh, don't ask. <laughs> Don't ask. I threw away some of the stuff that was dated more than 10 years ago. <laughs> really, I did. I threw, it, threw some away. So now we... Five years. <laughs> so that's probably... Between, the, the stuff between is, one and the 10 stuff, years. The stuff is between one and 10 years old. Oh, this is perfect. <laughs> Throwing things away. Oh, yeah. I, I can see that. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's yeah, I was stepping. Yeah, superb. I, I could hear it loud and clear. Um, it's all about the cocktail of drugs, isn't it? <laughs> uh, that's uh, so typical of Rick. You know, he. <laughs> He, I, I've got to tell you this story. He loved padlocks. He had padlocks for everything. But the trouble was he lost all the keys. We mixed them all up. So we spent most of the expedition unlocking and locking various things and, and trying to find keys for various other padlocks. It was so funny. But uh, he, I mean, you know, just like in that video, he'd never throw anything away. I remember he used to keep a uh, Duracell bat or batteries from head torches. And I said, well, why do you keep them? Once they're finished, why do you keep them? And he goes, well, they've still got a bit of life, you know, I mean, you know, I can, I can maybe use them again, you know, but I said, you know, they're finished. He said, well, they're not quite finished. <laughs> he never threw anything away. <laughs> I think we're, we're going to go to, to Nigel now. Nigel's got some, uh, some YouTube, um, input for us so thanks guys on youtube um sorry to have left you to, to, to this point but go ahead nigel hi uh yeah just a few things we've got um andrew storm said a good presentation we have uh, paul pritchard who said it's a lovely tribute to rick and wendy milne has shared a few memories um so rick actually stored his ropes in wendy's house uh, but he insisted on the underfloor heating to be kept on to keep them warm. Um, and she also said that he was so happy today that he and Alison married. That's it from YouTube. Okay, thanks, thanks, Nigel. Should we go to um, Should we go to Marianne? Uh, Marianne, can you unmute yourself? Or, yeah, good, there you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, everyone, or good morning. Um, in 2017, we were lucky, my wife and I, Sarah and I, were lucky enough to meet a lot of aspirants and have a wonderful meet in Chamonix. And Rick Allen joined us for that together with um, Victor Saunders. They joined us on the first day and Rick stayed with us for 14 days. He went climbing every single day with us novices in the mountains. And the pinnacle of it, uh, literally, uh, was a little expedition to the Grand Paradiso. And there was this fantastic mountaineer and he wouldn't bother to, you know, put, put his rope around the weakest members of our groups and encouraging, trotting up that relatively easy peak. But those were members who had a lot of respect for the mountains at that time. And it was the most amazing time where you know, the interaction with Rick during that meet, the stories he was telling us were all guiding us a little bit 
into the mountains and he shared his experiences. And he, so many people today said he was such a humble man. He invited us over, all 12 of us, into his apartment and we had a wonderful evening. He cooked for us. And he had the Hillary, Hillary Door Award standing in his bookshelf, supporting his books. It was all there and it was so inspiring to see a mountaineer of his scale to look after our humble novices. It was just fantastic. And um, yeah, when we learned of his death, a lot of the aspirants contacted me and my wife. And yeah, we, we had a long chat with everyone on the day. And yeah, we were really touched by Alan. And um, I think a lot of them, of, of um, those members of the meet are, are thinking a lot about Ray because he was so inspiring for so many of us. So yeah. I think that's something I wanted to share also in the name of all the participants of that meet. Thank you, Marion. Um, in fact, the, another person who was there, uh, Richard Ive, uh, he's a, an AC member, very fine climber, who couldn't be with us tonight, but Richard Ive um, wrote a little, a few words. He, he, he said this to me, uh, Rick was understated. He was also self-deprecating. I remember driving through the Mont Blanc tunnel from Chamonix to Courmayeur. Rick was at the wheel. When we got onto the subject of his Himalayan feats, he remarked that friends had often quipped that he was the best Himalayan mountaineer that you will never have heard of. It was, I think, a title that he was quietly proud of. He did not want to be known. He wanted to be in the mountains. It was that desire to be in and amongst the mountains that drove him on, not some narcissistic uh, fixation on self-promotion. Whilst in Chamonix, Richard, uh, Rick, sorry, Rick climbed with many AC members, old and new, young and old, as Marion was mentioning, experienced and inexperienced. He was happy to climb with enthusiastic partners. Everyone was delighted to climb with him, a Himalayan legend. So thanks, Richard, for that. That's uh, very nicely, nicely done. Ah, oh, um, Nick, I see Nick. Um, would you like to say something? Uh, let's unmute. Can, can we unmute Nick Fletcher? Mike, give us a second. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, this is where I do the filler. Um, Nick's joining us from Southeast London, I happen to know that. Um, so, um, Nick Fletcher, is the there name? We are. You're, you're with us, go ahead. Um, I only knew Rick for a few days um, and I want to uh, and my condolences, my particular condolences to those of you who knew him much, much better than me. Um, a bit like Marianne, um, uh, I encountered him on an AC meet in Italy and uh, he was just wonderful. In my line of work, they say, don't meet your heroes. Um, he absolutely is one of my heroes and uh, it was very exciting to suddenly find myself tying on with him. There'd been a big group ascent over Castor and we'd come down to the coal. And... Oh. Nick, you, you just went on to mute briefly. Okay. Uh, we, went down to the, we went down to the coal and yeah. then... Uh, he was the only person who was interested in doing a quick repeat of, of Pollux. So I suddenly found myself tied on with Rick Allen and it was a bit like suddenly finding you have a scene to play with Robert De Niro. Um, and he was so humble and uh, generous. Uh, that was very obvious the next day when we did a Brighthorn Traverse. I was tied on with Andy Wigley and he was tied on with uh, Lily. And um, we moved as two pairs and shared the abseils. But um, I know Lily was having some stamina issues and I just thought it was wonderful how Rick kept, kept her in the lead very patiently and smilingly, um, even though she was moaning a bit, I'm sure she <laughs> wouldn't mind me saying, and he just kept her in the lead so kindly uh, so that she um, achieved it. Um, I felt like I learned a lot from him in those two or three days, and it was such a privilege and pleasure to meet him. What a great man and climber. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. In fact, there was an Alpine Club meet uh, to Italy just uh, a week or so ago, and the Saluzzo uh, Italian Alpine Club members turned up, and um, we some fond words were, were shared about about Rick. 
Um, so, uh, Nigel, do you have any more, any more uh, YouTubers? Uh, no, no more. Sounds like it. And I think um, so. Unless anyone in particular would like to, I uh, put put your hand up. Um, um, now's your moment. Um, but if not, then that looks like it's going to be the, the, drawing this amazing evening to a close. Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously like to start off by by thanking the people who 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 shared those um, spontaneous thoughts at the end, um, really touching. And But also to our main speakers, uh, Simon, Nick, Jerry and Sandy, uh, thanks for helping to create this, which I believe is a, a really, really memorable tribute to, to Rick. Um, it's been hugely inspiring as well. So folks, we're, we're hoping to revive the Clubcast series at some point. Um, we've, we've been slightly on hold for various reasons. But, so do keep an eye on the Alpine Club Library YouTube page, which you can subscribe to for um, updates. And there you can watch, like and share all the previous Alpine Clubcasts, including the one with Rick, Rick Allen talking about the Mazzino Ridge. So folks, if you could all unmute yourselves now, I think Mike uh, is going to enable that. Um, thanks all for joining. Uh, keep safe. Please put your hands together to applaud tonight's speakers. Um, good night from London. finally reach our snow cave in the dark and we get in and we get the stove out mm -hmm. and the lighter won't work. We're used to not having any food on the mountain. That's We've been there before and that wasn't worrying us, but this was, a, this was a new game. The idea of not having any liquid was pretty scary. We pull out the sat phone and we put in a call. We call our agent and we say, Ali, we've summited. We're coming off the diameter side we're going to need help.